order. You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man. First of all today, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse is now on its fourth inquiry chair, as well as suffering several resignations from its legal team. But it is the inquiry's third chair, Dame Lowell Goddard, that's attracting most attention at the moment with the Home Affairs Select Committee about to hold a hearing on the circumstances surrounding her appointment and departure. But are they poised to call Theresa May, who was Home Secretary at the time, to give evidence? Let's talk to our assistant political editor, Norman Smith. Norman Smith, can you just remind us about the circumstances of her departure, Dame Lowell Goddard? Well, she left early August saying um, that, uh, well, the Home Secretary at Amber Rudd saying she left because of the distance she had to travel back to New Zealand. She was feeling lonely, suggesting it was personal reasons that had led to her resignation. But we now know very, very serious allegations have been made about the way she managed the inquiry and whether she had lost the confidence of uh, leading members of the inquiry team and also allegations about her attitude, particularly uh, claims that she'd made racist remarks. And I think what the MPs want to try and understand is if those sort of allegations were being made, were any of them relayed to ministers and in particular to the Home Secretary at the time, Theresa May? Because just speaking to MPs on the committee, they take the view that it is inconceivable that the Home Office at least was not aware of the deep concerns within the inquiry because members of the Home Office have been seconded to the inquiry and they just say it's just not credible that that sort of information wouldn't therefore have been known in the Home Office. Now, when you talk to Downing Street this morning, they insist at the very first uh, alarm bells were not sounded until the 29th of July. That was just a week or so before Justice Goddard resigned. In other words, Theresa May was not alerted. But that is not the only aspect of this which concerns MPs regarding the Prime Minister. There is also uh, an appetite to understand why the inquiry was set up as it was with this huge remit to uh, investigate pretty much the world and his wife, to investigate uh, allegations of abuse at Westminster and local mm. government and the military, the police, the BBC, the NHS, you name it. So a lot of roads come back to Theresa May. Right. And is there now a suggestion, in fact we've heard from Alexis Jay who is now going to chair the inquiry, that it will be scaled back, the scope of this inquiry? I think that's highly likely. I think there is a view that it is just out of control in terms of the extent of lines of inquiry it now has to pursue. There are question marks about how on earth you pull all that together in any sort of reasonable time frame. So I suspect you will hear from Alexis Jay probably later today saying she is going to pair the inquiry back. But that does raise questions about why it was set up in this way in the first place and indeed in the, the whole management of this inquiry because it was originally set up by Theresa May as a panel. It then had its remit extended to become a full-blown inquiry. And so as I say there are pretty fundamental questions about the Prime Minister's handling of this inquiry. Right, so is she, she's likely to be called then, is she, I and will she accept? I think she will be called, yes. I would suggest it's probably doubtful she will accept. I think she will say, no, it's the current Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, who now has responsibility for the department. Also, I mean, I'm struggling, but I can't remember a Prime Minister coming mm. before a departmental select committee. They appear before the Liaison Committee, but I can't honestly remember one appearing before a departmental committee, and I would imagine they would not want to go down that road. Yes, and presumably the Liaison Committee might be the time that they could mm. pose some of these questions anyway. Uh, Norman Smith, thank you very much. Should she appear before the committee, bearing in mind she was the Home Secretary at the time when these very serious questions and now allegations began to surface? Look, I think it's absolutely right that the Select Committee should do its job and scrutinise not only the civil servants but also ministers as well. But it is Amber Rudd who's in position now. And the Liaison Committee, as you've rightly said, has ample opportunity to be able to press the Prime Minister on this if we choose to do so um, at a later date. But I think we shouldn't let this overshadow the important work the inquiry is doing 
caring for victims. And my worry is actually this is somewhat sidetracking people from, from that important work and the work of Alexis Jay. And I'm glad that she's going to be talking later to get today to get people's focus back on that. Right. I mean, you say you're worried about it sidetracking what has already been a difficult inquiry to actually get going because of the resignations. Um, but we have heard, or it's been reported, that the permanent secretary to the Home Office, Mark Sedwell, implied that they already knew about allegations about Lowell Goddard's conduct when Theresa May was Home Secretary. Mm -hmm. And surely then the onus is on her to respond. Look, it was an independent inquiry, but what's important to recognise is the fact that there were civil servants from the Home Office seconded there, so there was a close link. Um, I think I'll be listening very closely to what the civil servants say they knew and when they knew it. But really, we do need to make sure that we don't lose sight of the inquiry itself. Should it be scaled back? Well, it's clearly in trouble onto its fourth head mm. with the controversy about the uh, judge from New Zealand set to go on and I hope that she actually uh, agrees to give evidence about what actually happened uh, and I think we're in danger of losing the uh, point of setting it up in the first place which was to try to deal with some of the uh, cover-ups that have been going on about child sexual abuse and many many lives being ruined but it's clearly got completely out of control it's far too wide-ranging in its right. remit for any person to be able to do it goes back 40 to 50 years it's a very very difficult ask for anyone as I think the churn in the inquiry of chairs has demonstrated that and that so must you do call, think it, sh it should think be calls, it should be more targeted well, they've got to see how they can begin to attack this remit because they're making no progress time is going on nobody is being satisfied and I think uh, for good reasons Theresa May wanted to have something done about this but I think that this has spiraled out of all control and it's not fit for purpose they've got to take another look at it right but they've also got to look at the expenditure of public money uh, uh, the judge uh, the judge had half a million pounds in uh, recompense well coming over here from New Zealand they will the look at that I presume in the select committee won't at. they do you think it's been well handled well, I think it hasn't made the progress we'd have hoped it to. Um, and but whose fault is that? Well, whether it's to do with the terms of the inquiry, whether it's to do with the people, ultimately victims will be saying that it hasn't made the progress it should have. Um, and I hope that Alexis Jay, when she speaks today, will show a clear way forward. But I don't think Angela's right to say it's made no progress, and victims' groups would, would actually say well, what that... What progress has been made? Uh, well, starting to identify the sorts of inquiries and 13 inquiries that it should be undertaking. Uh, but the scale of what's being done is very ambitious and I'll be listening very carefully to what Alexis J says, says later today. Right, I mean if it is going to be restricted in some way, in what way would you like to see it more limited in its scope? Well what I'd like to see is uh, is, is, is victims having um, some clear answers as to how these sorts of abuse allegations were dealt with in the past, uh, whether it, the inquiry needs to have the breadth of scope across the public and private sector I think is something I'll be listening carefully to uh, later on today if, if Alexis Jay makes a statement uh, because I think by focusing the inquiry perhaps in a less ambitious way across all those sectors we might be able to get some results sooner. Are you confident Alexis Jay is going to be able to do this job any better than her predecessors who've now gone? Well I certainly hope so you can but hope mm. uh, because otherwise we're just going to get into a round of, of ongoing problems. I think a lot of the uh, victims would say that what they want is to create a circumstance where people cannot be subject to the kind of horrors that they were subject to in the past again in the future and so I think it's also important that we try to learn lessons about how child abuse is dealt with uh, how uh, all the authorities deal with it and how we can best protect uh, victims I think that that is a key point for everybody concerned and do you think then learning the lessons the historical lessons um, because there is a history here that being examined about child abuse do you do you think that can still help today absolutely and I think we'd be letting the victims down if we didn't make sure that the recommendations that come out of the inquiry do um, absolutely get embedded whenever in the it reports of course uh, a run in the future. All right, let's leave it there. I'm sorry, but we must now move on. Urgent question, Lisa Nandy. Thank you, Mr Yay. Speaker. To ask the Home Secretary to make a statement on the remit, organisation, budget and staffing of the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. And the chaos. Secretary of State for the Home Department, Secretary Amber Rudd. Yay. Yay. Thank you.
you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to make a statement on the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. I know the whole House agrees with me when I say that the work of this inquiry is absolutely vital. Victims and survivors must have justice, and we must learn the lessons of the past. The inquiry's remit is to examine whether institutions in England and Wales have failed to protect children from sexual abuse. It's an independent body established under the Inquiries Act 2005. The Home Office is the sponsor department. I'm responsible for the terms of reference, appointing the chair and panel members, and providing funding. Last year, the inquiry had a budget of £17.9 million and underspent by over £3 million. The appointment of staff and the day-to-day running are matters for the chair. I appointed Professor Alexis Jay as chair of the inquiry on the 11th of August, following the unexpected resignation of Dame Lowell Goddard on the 4th of August. Mr Speaker, I am aware of questions around the reasons for her resignation, and let me spell out the facts. On the 29th of July, the Secretary to the Inquiry met my Permanent Secretary and reported concerns about the professionalism and competence of the Chair. My Permanent Secretary encouraged the Inquiry to raise those matters with the Chair. He reported this meeting to me the same day. My Permanent Secretary also met members of the Inquiry panel on the 4th of August. Later that day, Dame Lowell tendered her resignation to me, which I accepted. Less than a week elapsed between concerns being raised with the Home Office and Dame Lowell's resignation. My Permanent Secretary's approach was entirely appropriate for an independent body. The second issue relates to my evidence to the Home Affairs Committee. I was asked why Dame Lowell had gone. Dame Lowell had not spoken to me about her reasons, so I relied on the letter she had sent to the committee. In her letter, she said she was lonely and felt that she could not deliver, and that was why she stepped down. Dame Lowell has strongly refuted the allegations about her, and the only way we could understand properly why she resigned would be to hear from Dame Lowell herself. To echo any further allegations which are now likely to be the subject of legal dispute would have been entirely inappropriate. We now owe it to victims and survivors to get behind the inquiry in its Mm endeavour. My own commitment to the inquiry's work is undiminished and I invite the House to offer its support in the same way. Order. I have no wish to be disobliging to the Secretary of State, but for the record and the propriety of these proceedings, I should just mention that in no meaningful sense of the term was the Secretary of State making a statement to the House, which is a matter of conscious and deliberate choice by government. The Right Honourable Lady was responding, and she has responded timiously, to an urgent question which I have granted. In other words, the Secretary of State's here because she's been asked to be here, not because she asked to be here. It's quite an important distinction which we ought to respect in the language that we use. Lisa Nandy. Mr Speaker, the Home Secretary is right to say that the inquiry is of profound significance, not just to survivors, but to the whole country. It is independent, as she's right to remind us, but these the events and the problems that have beset the inquiry since its beginning also raised profound questions of accountability. The Home Secretary referred to the evidence that she gave to the Home Affairs Select Committee on the 7th of September in which she said that all the information she had was that Justice Goddard had quit because she was a long way from home and too lonely. She says she was relying simply on a letter. Why didn't she ask Justice Goddard herself why she had quit the inquiry? We've since learnt that senior officials in that department were aware of concerns about Justice Goddard's conduct on the 29th of July before she resigned and it's alleged that Liz Sanderson, an advisor to her predecessor who is now the Prime Minister and Mark Sedwell, the Permanent Secretary, knew about concerns long before then. Can she clarify to the House that this is the case? Tell us on which date the Home Office became aware there were problems. Tell us on which exact date she personally or her predecessor became aware that there were problems over the 16 months that the chair was in post and who made them aware of those problems. Given that 38 Home Office staff are seconded to the inquiry, how could she possibly have been unaware of these concerns as late as the 7th of September? And can she tell us why 
Given that the Home Office knew of the serious questions about the behaviour and leadership of the inquiry, she then went on to authorise a payoff to Justice Goddard worth £80,000. Can she confirm the Home Secretary is the only person who can terminate the Chair's contract? And in that contract, misconduct is grounds for dismissal. Can she tell us why then that wasn't acted upon? Can she tell us whether she or the Prime Minister have intervened to request that Justice Goddard appears before the Home Affairs Select Committee? <laughs> and if not, will they now urgently do so? Finally. Can she explain to us the circumstances surrounding Finally. the departure of the lead counsel, Ben Emerson, <coughs> QC? And can she tell us whether any compensation has been paid to him or the four other senior lawyers who have quit the inquiry? Finally. Can she give survivors assurances about how this inquiry will proceed in the future? And finally, Mr Speaker, this inquiry was established in order to shine a spotlight on institutions characterised by a culture of secrecy, denial and cover-up in which child abusers yeah, were yeah, able yeah. to operate yeah. in plain sight without challenge or consequence. It is a tragedy that this inquiry itself has been dogged yeah. by allegations of a similar nature with which child abuse, abusers will be only, abuse victims will be far too familiar. If this inquiry is to proceed with confidence, these questions must be answered. It's very cheeky for an honourable member to use the word finally <laughs> in what I might call the Hughes sense, a reference to the former member for Old Southwark and Bermondsey, who was wont to follow the use of that word with several further sentences. The Home Secretary. Speaker, I will endeavour to answer the Honourable Lady's questions as fully as possible. She asked initially about my comments in front of the Home Affairs Select Committee as to why Dame Noel Goddard had left. And I would just like to quote to her from the letter which she sent. And she says, it was never easy operating in an environment in which I had no familiar networks and there were times when it seemed a very lonely mission. It is referring to that note that I gave my answer to the Home Affairs Select Committee. She made several inquiries about staffing. And I would say to the Honourable Lady, we can only maintain the independence of this inquiry by being absolutely clear that the matters of staffing are for the Chair. It is not for the Home Office to control the staffing. It is for the Chair to appoint <coughs> the members of staff, and they have operational independence to do so. She also requested, she also inquired as to whether we had, I had asked Dame Lowell Goddard to appear before the Select Committee. I have indeed passed on that request that was specifically requested. I can say that at all times my department has followed the correct procedure, the formal procedure, and will continue to do so in order to at all times have true accountability on transparency on what is so important. The, the fact that this inquiry is independent is absolutely essential to garnering the support that is needed from the expert panel who are part of it and from the victors and survivors. Mr Tim Lawton. Mr Speaker, can I support the Home Secretary in emphasising the importance of this inquiry carrying on its important uh, uh, work? Uh, can she uh, also acknowledge that tomorrow Alexis Jay and other panel members, as well as her own permanent sector, will be in front of the Home Affairs uh, Select uh, Committee? Will she agree that it would be very helpful if Lowell Goddard would agree to appear in person in front of us? And finally, uh, Mr Speaker, whilst respecting the independence of such an inquiry, uh, there is a duty for the Home Secretary and the Home Affairs Select Committee as a scrutinising uh, body to make sure it is fit for purpose and spending public money wisely. But does she agree it is not sufficient for a chairman to be entirely self-regulating if things are going wrong, as she appears to suggest? Well, I thank my honourable friend for that question, and he is absolutely right. We do need to point out that uh, the Permanent Secretary is appearing before the Home Affairs Select Committee tomorrow, um, as is the new chair, Alexis Jay, who I'm sure will get the confidence that she deserves from the Select Committee and from other parties who listen to her. Um, he is right that the, the, the operational independence of the chair is also dependent on support from the expert panel. And when my uh, <coughs> Permanent Secretary was approached by the Secretary, Secretary of the Independent Inquiry about concerns on July the 29th, he absolutely rightly referred the Secretary to ask the expert panel to take it up with the Chair. The relationship between the Chair and the expert panel is central to this, and so in that way the Chair would not be able to act independently because she needs the support of the expert panel. And Diane Abbott. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
The government is now on its fourth chair of the inquiry into child sexual abuse. No inquiry in modern times has been mired in such chaos. At the very least, it suggests a certain incompetence, both in setting the terms and selecting the personnel to lead it. This is bad for policy, bad for the Home Office, but above all, this is a terrible situation for the survivors of child sex abuse who have put so much hope and trust in the successful conclusion of this inquiry. The latest scandal is the departure of then Justice Lowell Goddard amidst allegations of high-handedness and racist remarks. The Home Secretary has said that um, she has repeated that when she appeared for the Home Affairs Select Committee on September the 7th, she said all the information she had was that Lowell had quit because she was a long way from home and too lonely. And she says that she was reliant on Justice Goddard's letter. But why didn't she ask? Why didn't she get a formal response from her as to why she was going? In the absence of any attempt to get formal information other than the letter, the Home Secretary finds herself in a position where she will have to defend herself against accusations of misleading the committee. It is clear from the statements for the victims and their families that they believe there will be no change to the remit of the inquiry and no reduction in its scope. Who on behalf of the inquiry and Home Office has communica communicated that to them? Was this Home Office policy at the time? Has it changed? And why has it changed? And will there be any attempts to scale back the inquiry? And if that, w if that was to happen, does the Secretary of State agree that scaling back an inquiry on which so many hopes rest amongst individuals who have spent a lifetime in pain and misery from early abuse, to scale back the inquiry would be to make the survivors pay for the government's failure in managing this inquiry? Here, here, here. Um, the Honourable Lady uh, confuses a number of items in her questions, and I respectfully say to the Honourable Lady that her inquiries to me about scaling back the inquiry reveal the fact that she has failed to understand that this is an independent inquiry. I would urge her to look at the terms of reference which were set through this Parliament last year, and they are very clear on the independence. It is essential to maintain the confidence of the survivors and victims that that independence is maintained and is seen to be maintained. There is no question of the Home Office scaling back an inquiry. This is for the Chair of the inquiry, Alexis Jay, who has such a strong reputation in this area, who did the Rotherham inquiry and and has a strong reputation for her work in that. And I would urge the Honourable Lady to acquaint herself a little bit more with what the independence means, and I hope that that will mean that she will therefore have more confidence in the process we have. Well, Cheryl Gillan. Having worked for many years with my constituent Tom Perry, who works with Mandate Now and uh, the Survivors Trust, uh, who seek to require all staff working in regulated activities to report concerns about a child's welfare to the local authority, I know how important this inquiry is. So can the Home Secretary agree that this inquiry is indeed a vital tool for uncovering where children and young people have been failed by government and institutions in the past? And would she undertake again to look at mandatory reporting? Uh, my right honourable friend raises a, a personal case which is so important for us all to bear in mind when we think about the scale of this inquiry and people bring forming uh, criticisms. There are always these independent stories, these independent stories which remind us how important it is to get the truth and justice for them and to learn from them so that we can make sure that these institutions make improvements going forward. And of course, I will indeed look at what she has suggested. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every MP in this chamber is anxious for the inquiry to succeed. But before we can draw a line under recent difficult problems and move on, we need honesty and transparency from the Home Office. When the Home Secretary appeared before the Home Affairs Committee in September, alongside the Permanent Secretary, she left members with the impression that Justice Goddard resigned because, in short, she was lonely. There was no mention of conduct concerns then, or indeed in her subsequent letter to the Acting Chair. So for clarity's sake, 
Did she know before giving evidence that day or before writing the letter about the concerns that had been raised? Will the Home Secretary confirm that only she could remove the inquiry chair from office and the limited grounds for doing so include misconduct grounds? And isn't that why all of these questions on her state of knowledge are so important? Will she confirm that the Secretary to the inquiry that she's already referred to is a lifelong Home Office staffer and that the Secretary regularly meets with the Permanent Secretary to update as to progress? And is she categorically stating that these issues were not raised before July? And if they were not raised before July, then why on earth were they not raised before that date? When did either the Permanent Secretary or Special Advisers first make either the current or previous Home Secretaries aware? And when she gave evidence to the Home Affairs Committee, was she being economical about what she knew or had she been badly briefed by the Permanent Secretary? Because it has to be one or the other. Finally, Mr Speaker, does she accept that by sticking their heads in the sand, the Home Office hierarchy allowed the inquiry to descend into a state of paralysis, uh, which is something that we must never see again? I fear it's rather discourteous for the honourable gentleman to suggest or imply that the Home Secretary might be economical with what she knew. That comes fairly close to crossing the line, and given that the honourable gentleman has a prepared text, and therefore he must have had foreknowledge of what he was going to say, can I suggest for the future that he ought to phrase it rather differently? Home Secretary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I, can I start by reassuring the honourable gentleman? There is no paralysis. He particularly used that phrase. Um, the, the inquiry is full tilt. It is working at full speed under Alexis J and will continue to do so. Um, he asks about the dates, which I believe I set up very clearly in my response to the urgent question, which is that I knew about this on July the 29th, and it was one week before a Dame Lowell Goddard resigned. In terms of the allegations that he referred to. I would just point out that these allegations are absolutely denied by Dame Justice Goddard, so it would not be appropriate for me to refer to them and to speculate on them while there may indeed be legal action following them. Seema Kennedy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, many of our constituents have suffered from child sexual abuse and they live every day with its consequences. Can the Home Secretary confirm to the House that this inquiry will be a number one personal priority for her? Yeah. I can confirm to, the honourable, to my honourable friend that this is a priority for us. It's a priority to this government and I believe it is a priority across the House because, as she says, we all know of constituents who have suffered and quite rightly are expecting action. Mr David Winnick. Is the Home Secretary aware there's bound to be disappointment that when she appeared before us on the select, at the Select Committee hearing on the 7th of September and in reply to questions why Judge, uh, Ju uh, Judge Goddard had resigned, she didn't give further information which was relevant to her resignation and which didn't in any way involve any possible legal action. But on the wider issue, would the Home Secretary accept, Mr Speaker, that there is now a lack of confidence there's no other way to put it, that the inquiry will carry out the very crucial task of the sex, sexual exploitation of children and no indication whatsoever of a timescale. It could go on for many years and it would be a farce, an absolute farce, if such an important subject, an inquiry which is so important, should end in the way which many of us fear could be the position. Well, I would urge the Honourable Gentleman to give his support to the inquiry. Let us all try and find a way of being confident about it. Alexis Jay, the Chair, has said that she expects to conclude, she hopes to conclude the inquiry by the end of 2020. But it is perhaps for us in the House and for the Home Affairs Select Committee to give her the assistance. I'm not suggesting anything but the most thorough of scrutiny. But it may be that we need to give as much assistance as we can to making sure that the new Chair can really do a thorough and successful job going forward. You see, Alan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I very much welcome the appointment of Professor Jay to take forward this inquiry. Can the Home Secretary confirm that victims of child sexual exploitation in my constituency will be able to engage with this inquiry and share their experiences? Well, I thank my humble friend for, the, for that uh, question, and she is absolutely right. Dame Alexis, sorry, Alexis Jay has the experience to be able to do this inquiry, and under the Truth Project, one of the strands within the inquiry, we are encouraging people to come forward and speak to the inquiry about their experience. Matt Cooper. 
The Home Secretary is right to talk about the independence of the inquiry and we all want Professor Jay to be able to make a success of such an important inquiry now. But of course there is continued concern because this is the fourth chair, because this is the second legal team and also the lack of transparency that there seems to have been about the problems from both the inquiry and the Home Office. So is she satisfied that the transparency arrangements for the inquiry are strong enough and that there will Will be enough accountability for the progress of the inquiry as it goes forward now. Well, the Right Honourable Lady raises uh, the point which is at the crux of this. Have we got the right balance of independence and transparency? And I recognise that that is something that I need to reassure people and hopefully demonstrate on, and that is one of the reasons I'm here in the House myself to make that point. But I will watch it carefully to make sure that we continue, I believe, to get the right balance giving the independence that is necessary, but also being as transparent within that as possible. Craig Williams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think it's worth reiterating this point, and I hope my right honourable friend agrees with me and reinforces to this House that protecting the independence, strictly independence nature of this inquiry is incredibly important, and whether she could continue that reassurance. I, th I thank my honourable friend for that point. He's absolutely right. Ensuring that the people have confidence in this inquiry is also about maintaining the independence of this inquiry. Mr. Anderson, Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, instead of making this all about lawyers and judges and even about ministers, can we bring the focus back to where it really needs to belong? And that is on the needs and wishes and interests of the victims here. And in that regard, as this goes forward, will the Home Secretary give us an assurance that any uh, request for access from victims' representatives to her or the inquiry will be met and that the victim's voice in government will be heard and that any victim who is pursuing justice by an other route will not find that route prejudiced by any shortcomings in the inquiry? I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for making that important point. It is, of course, about the victims and survivors. And when I wanted to uh, make inquiries about appointing a new chair, I did, of course, consult with the victims and survivors consultative panel to ensure that they were supportive, which indeed they were. But he is absolutely right. We must make sure that they are always at the centre of our words. And Ed Arger. Thank you, sir. As well as being absolutely vital, this very important inquiry is strictly independent, as honourable members have emphasised. Would my right honourable friend agree that it's also vital we let it do its work and await its report, rather than anyone seeking in any way to preempt its findings? I, I thank my honourable friend, and he is right. We are caught between our impatience for finding out more and the need to keep it independent. Uh, I'm, we are hoping for an interim statement on the inquiry by this financial year for the end of March next year, and I hope that that will shed some light on progress to date. Mr Paul Flynn. The Savile report took 12 years, spent £190 million to report on a single incident that took place over two hours. This, this inquiry has been given the mission impossible to report on hundreds of thousands of incidents that took place over many decades. Isn't it time for the House to confess that this was a political escape hole to recover from an embarrassing situation and we make it clear to the committee that this matter of course is of vital importance but they must be allowed to reshape which we shape the report and the inquiries so that we can be reported uh, within our lifetimes. Well, I don't share uh, the Honourable Gentleman's view about this being a political inquiry of any sort. I think it is essential, important and valued by everybody in this House, certainly, and in the nation generally. I think we have a select committee who will continue to make their inquiries of it. And I also, as I said earlier, Alexis Jay has indicated that she hopes to conclude it by the end of 2020. Baron Davis. Mr Speaker, given that we are where we are now with the resignation of um, <coughs> J uh, Dame Justice Goddard, does my right honourable friend agree with Professor Jay when she says that the inquiry is open for business and agree that it can go forward now with its vital work in confidence to demonstrate its accountability? 
Yeah, yeah, yes, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Uh, well, we may have a, a discussions, urgent questions and statements on issues of staffing, but the fact is the inquiry is going ahead. The inquiry is taking evidence and the chair is working hard to make sure that she delivers as soon as possible. John Mann. Mr Speaker, they're not taking evidence from everyone yet. I'm the appointed representative of some of the survivors from my constituency and my office is assisting others with statements. None of that has gone forward yet. Isn't there a danger that this is going to become another lawyer's bunfest with judges and barristers resigning and large numbers of lawyers not just queuing up but at the front of the queue to make large amounts of money both representing people to the inquiry but simultaneously uh, taking legal civil action against the authorities. What is government going to do to ensure that the survivors are at the heart of this rather than the lawyers? We always make sure that survivors are at the heart of this. There is nevertheless a legal role to be done and there are expenses associated with having an inquiry. But there is no blank cheque and one role that the Home Office does have a constant engagement with is making sure that the budgets are carefully set and challenged each year so that the proper costs are associated with it. Mr Peter Bone. Speaker, um, I'm sure the government's inquiry, uh, not the, the inquiry is moving forward in the right way, but I hope we're not being deflected from child abuse that's going on at the moment, especially for children that are trafficked into this country. And one of the things we could do urgently is remove the protection of children are trafficked from local communities, local governments, to national government and the Home Office. And if the Home Secretary would be willing to look into that, I think that would improve things enormously. Well, I, th I thank my honourable friend for that question and I know of his action and strong reputation on the issue of trafficking and I would of course be uh, delighted to speak to him on any matter in this area that he has advice on. I, I would like to reassure him though that uh, a key element of this inquiry is about learning from the past in order to, in order to improve institutions going forward. Mr David Hanson. Mr Speaker, uh, would the Home Secretary accept that there are some serious questions to be asked about the due diligence that was undertaken in the appointment of Justice Goddard in the first place? Has she had an opportunity to discuss with her predecessor what steps she took to ensure Justice Goddard was up for the job? And could she just, for me, confirm exactly what date she expects the interim report to, to come forward, exactly what date she expects the final report, and what the total cost of the inquiry will be? Uh, as, as far as the interim report is concerned, we have, we have asked for one by the end of this financial year, so we would expect it, we hope, in March, April next year. I have already indicated that we hope that the final report will be completed by the end of 2020, but I cannot be prescriptive about that. That is for the Chair to decide, but that is the indication she has given. Mr Philip Hollerberg. Can the Home Secretary reassure my constituents that the work of this important inquiry wasn't stopped each time a chairman stood down and can she reassure the House that there's a robust system of deputy chairs in place? Well, I thank my honourable friend and I can reassure him that considerable work has already been done over the past 16 months and the new chair is aware of the need to get confidence again and to pick up activity with all due urgency and I can reassure him that she is taking that obligation and that momentum that she has now picked up very seriously. Margaret Ferrier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When I asked the former Prime Minister an oral question about the loss of survivor testimonies that were submitted through the inquiry website, he said he would write to me. What he meant was that he would print a press release from the inquiry website and forward it on. This patronising and irresponsible approach has been the only consistent theme of the inquiry. Isn't it time that this government started listening to, le to the legitimate concerns of survivors and experts and the knowledge that unless something changes, it's simply being set up to fail? I would respectively ask the Honourable Lady to perhaps engage with the inquiry in a little bit more of a positive manner. Yeah, yeah. This, gov this, side, this government set this up and we are absolutely serious about wanting to assist survivors and victims and wanting to make sure that we make the changes to institutions that are necessary going forward. The right honourable gentleman says Parliament set up, he is absolutely right. But I like to think that this government had some part in making sure that that took place. If the honourable lady would like to 
write to me about the particular instance that she refers to, I would of course be happy to respond and, and rest assured I will. Order, no, I, unless I'm much mistaken, the Honourable Lady, the Member for Lewis, who's the most assiduous attender at our proceedings, was not here at the start of these exchanges in the Chamber. If she was, that's fine. I have been advised she wasn't, but her word is good enough. If she says she was, that's good enough for me. She was here at the start of this exchange on this matter. Very good. Maria Caulfield. Um, can the Home Secretary um, outline for me whether Professor Jay and the panel actually have the resources they need to complete this inquiry, and if not, um, what extra help can be given to them? Well, my honourable friend raises an important question. I mean, the, these inquiries are not always popular because they are, they can be costly. But the fact is the Home Office has a, a careful management technique to make sure that we look always essentially and carefully, really, at the cost that might be involved. And can I reassure my honourable friend that we will always make sure that they are sufficiently funded to do the job well? Lillian Greenwood. Speaker, as part of its work, the inquiry was due to investigate the sexual abuse of children in the care of Nottingham City and Nottinghamshire County Councils, one of its first phase investigations. As she knows, survivors in my constituency have already waited not just years but decades for their voice to be heard. What assurances can she give to my constituents who are desperate to secure a measure of justice about the time frame for those investigations? Well, I completely understand uh, the needs for her constituents to have a better view on the timing that they might see in terms of the progress of this inquiry. And what I would say to them is that now we have a chair who has said she is going to move with momentum, with pace. I would expect them to hear from her, for her soon. But I, I'm so sorry to have to repeat this, the Honourable Lady, but it is for the inquiry to decide how to proceed. But I would hurt, urge her to engage with the chair in order to get an answer. Ah, Jim Churchill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, following on from the Honourable Member for Wellingborough's question, with the movement of people and the vulnerability of children of concern to all of us in this House, what steps is the government taking with other nations in order to tackle the global challenge of child sexual abuse in order to learn to better inform this inquiry? Well, I thank my honourable friend for, the, for that question, and I, I can tell her that uh, internationally we are viewed as being ahead of other countries in trying to address this. We have a number of initiatives online to make sure that we share good practice and engage with other countries, and of course the Modern Slavery Act is one way of making sure that less abuse takes place, and we are again an international leader in that area. Chris Bryant. I've known far too many people who've been abused in my life. Um, a co colleague at Theological College who used to cry herself to sleep every single night because of the abuse she'd suffered as a child. A young member of the congregation where I was a curate who self-harmed uh, for months on end because of what she was abu the abuse she had from one of her teachers. Um, another ordinand who was abused by the Bishop of Gloucester, a man in power and authority and spiritual authority over him. And for all of those people, and for doubtless all the others we all know, the thing that matters more than anything else is getting to the truth, so that what they know in their heart is known by everybody else to have been the truth. And I just say very, very gently to the Home Secretary, if she could possibly, if at any point she has a choice between telling, letting everything out into the open and keeping some things back, she always goes for the former, not the latter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, I completely agree with the right honourable gentleman. It is particularly incumbent on those of us who have anything to do with an inquiry about transparency, about abuse, to make sure that we are as transparent and as accountable and as frank with people as possible. And I can reassure the right honourable gentleman that I will always do that. I would also like to turn the emphasis, though, back to the inquiry, back to the new chair, so that we can actually get on with the progress that is so essential to his constituents and to all of ours. Mr Stephen Pound. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. David Cameron was very fond of quoting Justice Brandeis's dictum that sunlight is the best disinfectant. And in the spirit of the comment from my honourable friend from Rhonda, would the Home Secretary not agree that we need to actually get all these facts out in the open now? Would she allow, and in fact even encourage, former panel members to share their fears and concerns in public in order that we can start with a completely, completely clean sheet? 
Well, I, I'd like to reassure uh, my right on, the right honourable gentleman that uh, the new chair ha does take that approach in terms of full transparency. But I don't want to mislead him so that the Home Office can do too much on that. We can be frank and open with every stage that we have been involved with it, but it is for the inquiry to really answer some of these detailed questions. And I would just remind the House that Alexis Jay is in fact in front of the Home Affairs Select Committee tomorrow and hopefully will be able to answer some of his questions. Jonathan Edwards. Mr Speaker. When the Makua report was presented earlier this year, it contained hundreds of reduc uh, reductions, apparently to avoid prejudic prejudicing court actions, much to the dismay of victim victims in uh, North Wales. What can she do to ensure that the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, when it reports, will have a minimal amount of reductions in order to help victim victims obtain justice in the courts? Well, I can honestly say that I share the Honourable Gentleman's view that an inquiry of this nature, of this seriousness, should have the minimum amount of redactions because what we expect as a government, as a country, is a full open inquiry that will allow our constituents, people in our country who have been abused, to really have the truth and justice opportunity that they are seeking, and then for us and for institutions who have been involved to learn so that this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Order.